That must be for you. Okay, here we go. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, to see you. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, Talks at GS, and I'm pleased to welcome everyone uh, who's watching on Yahoo Finance and to introduce our guest today, Paul Tudor Jones. Uh, I'd say, dare say, a good friend of mine. We've worked together for, uh, for a number of years on various matters. I'm sure that will come up. Uh, Paul was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. So the accent is, uh, which you know, has worked very, very well for him, is not a put on. Still here. Not a put on. Uh, in 1980, four years after graduating from the University of Virginia, just four years, he went from trading cotton futures to founding his own hedge fund, Tudor Investment Corp. In 1988, he founded the Robin Hood Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to alleviating po uh, poverty in New York City. Uh, and in 2013, he co-founded Just Capital, a nonprofit dedicated to building a marketplace that better reflects the priorities of the American people. Now, that is some sketchy thing, and there's a lot to fill it in, in between. <laughs> and so, uh, let's just uh, let's start. And I think the first uh, the first thing I just want to ask, and just for the benefit of, of the people here and a lot of young people who are in the early stages of their career, um, you get out of school. Uh, you trade cotton. I think, did you work for a firm at all? Uh, I went to work for E.F. Hutton. E.F. Hutton, that sounds so conventional. Yes. It, no one here lost. gets the joke, right? Yes, 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 that's there right. There was this great commercial when E.F. Hutton talks, and then it'd be like a, a flash mob. Yeah. Everybody listens. Yeah, it's like Superman changing in a phone booth. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Uh, phone booth. Um, so you trade, you go on the floor, cotton futures, very rough and tumble. You go, you do well, you start it. Tell me, how did, how, did, how did you become who you are? Um, well, it, it's funny. I got to be a trader uh, probably because when I was really, really young, I was a game fanatic. I played every single game that there was, Monopoly, Life, Parcheesi, uh, poker. I used to play hours of solitaire. I just loved playing games. And so... You're very competitive in solitaire? Uh, everything. <laughs> um, well, oh gosh, there's a lot of things I can say, but I won't. <laughs> um, I'm li thank God I, I see the head of my, uh, the head of my investor relations here is going, be calm. <laughs> Remember, there's a lot. This is a public a venue. Don't be yourself. Yes, whatever you do, be don't be yourself. That's what I get. Whatever I walk out, whatever you do, don't be uh, yourself. So, so, so anyway, I, pl I played a whole bunch of games. Uh, chess, bad game when I was older. When I was in college, I was the booking of fraternity. So I had, by the time I uh, graduated from college, I already had probably at least a master's in probabilistic theory. And so uh, when I was in college, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do other than drink beer. And that I was extraordinarily good at. Um, so I think it was February of my senior year, uh, the guy that I inherited the book from said to me, oh man, and he, his, his name was Bob Wilson of Wilson, Arkansas. Uh, Robert E. Lee Wilson V of Wilson, Arkansas, he said, um, you got to try this soybean futures. Uh, I'm back and we're hedging up. They had a huge plantation at the time in Arkansas. We're hedging up our soybean crop. And this, this just makes, this makes football gambling just pale in comparison. And then literally that weekend, I read a story on a guy named Richard Dennis, who was the biggest local uh, at the Board of Trade. And then he used to say that he did his best trading when he was hung over because there was no emotion, and I thought, hmm, this is starting to get close to what I'm culturally pretty good at. Uh, and uh, I just, it's so funny, what I found in life, I heard, uh, I was home last night with my kids who are 21 and 28, and we listened to the commencement address from Stanford this year, and uh, I, I, his first name was Sterling, he's the actor, uh, the black actor on This Is Us, what's his last name? Sterling Brown. Sterling Brown said, to have, the secret to happy life is not to have a career or a profession or to want to go do this, but to have a calling. Uh, and so for me, I think in everything that I've done, it has been a calling. It's drawn me, something's drawn me to it rather than me thinking, gee, I've got to go there. 
Uh, and I think, I think those are really, it's a really profound concept that let life pull you in the direction that just comes naturally and you're going to find that perfect intersection of purpose and happiness. And so, now just, were you, were you, did, when you were country, were you a local? So I started out... On the floor above. I started out as... Uh, Not that anybody knows what this means anymore. Right. Well, that's actually a really interesting point, um, being a local back then. Um, These are the people who stood in the pits. Yeah. And, they, you know, everybody saw the movie Trading Places, and they waved their arms, and they say to, you know... So, so that, that, that actually, if I think back, that might be the biggest miss that I had in my career was, uh, and we'll get to that in a second, but I started out working as a broker, and back then it was great because uh, 21 years old, they come in, you take the Series 7, it literally took two weeks to study and pass it, and then they hand you, uh, back then they handed you, at least in the, in, in the commodity division EF Hutton, this uh, gave me a book on technical analysis, technical analysis of stock trends by McGee and Edwards. Yep. He told me, read that. I read it. Go home, read it again. I read it. Go home, read it again. I read it. He goes, you're ready to trade. You're ready to open accounts. So uh, I'd say within four weeks, I was trying to talk my parents' friends into opening accounts and let me trade. Uh, and at 21, it was, it was literally hilarious. Um, but that's how I started. And then ultimately, as I started trading these accounts, uh, the guy that I worked for that originally hired me was the greatest spe cotton speculator uh, in the world. His name was Eli Tull, so he'd sent me to New York City. Uh, I, I guess I was up here for six months working on the floor. Uh, then I went back to New Orleans. That's another long story. Came back to New York, uh, and, and during that period of time, I, I enjoyed so much the interaction with all my customers. I really, really, I've always been, I think, a sociable person, so I enjoyed that so much. But we were making money and talking to them all the time, but then after a while I realized I could do so much better if I just traded for myself, because the commissions back then were, and this is going to make you really excited, were $90 a contract. Can well, you imagine right, that? Yeah. And what is it now? Is so it, you could trade 40000 for $90 yes, today. Yes, exactly. So it was $90 a contract, and I realized I could go trade for myself and clear I think even then clearing was still 30 or 40 cents a contract and just do, and I, and I started doing that for myself uh, and I did really, really, really. So you were really, successful from the start? Pretty much. You know, I had, <laughs> I had, I had two phenomenal learning periods where I lost everything. Like I had $10,000 and went down to zero and then I made back like $20,000 and then went down to zero uh, and I remember are you just using these low numbers so we can understand? No, no, no. This is when you're 22 years of age and it's 1978 or 9. That's just, you know, a gargantuan amount of money. And I remember my father coming to me uh, on the third time uh, and said, you've got to get in something safe like real estate. Exactly. Uh, Lending. I said, no, I I'm going to stick with this. Uh, and the rest is history, but... I guess the point was, it was so funny, I, was, I guess by 1980, I was doing pretty well, and in 1980, I thought my father kept going, you've got to do something respectable. So I applied to Harvard Business School and uh, got in, uh, and I was thinking, okay, I'm going to go up there, and what is this place going to teach me? That I, I mean, I was already doing, I was probably making a couple of million bucks a year trading my own account, which was a fortune back then. And the weekend before I was supposed to go, I was loading up the U-Haul to drive to Boston and just said, ah, this is crazy. They're not going to teach me anything about this, and this may disappear. And so I never went uh, and continued trading. For less but I started my hedge fund. You get back to the point. I enjoy, I'm, the one thing about trading for yourself, I got so lonely. I really did. I was doing real well, but I was so lonely. And back then... Account exchange closed at 3, I'd go home at, I'd do all my charts and stuff, go home at 4.30, watch Star Trek, and that was kind of, that was kind of my life. It was not, uh, it, was, it was financially fulfilling, but it was uh, unfulfilling in every other, 
every other way. Right, so about the intellectual satisfaction of talking to the other locals. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, that was why that ended up being the greatest mass extinction in, in, uh, in yeah. my lifetime. Um, that, that would be my one biggest, if I had one regret, it was, uh, there were probably 100,000 people like me, if you think about the 80s, that were floor traders. On, the ecosystem was big. It was enormous, and it probably supported, I would say, something in the neighborhood of five to $10 billion in profits, even not evenly distributed, certainly not evenly distributed, but distributed over that ecosystem. And then along came electronic trading, and it was really interesting because there literally was a mass extinction of entire profession, and it happened so slowly and incrementally that no one ever saw it. And it was, it was really kind of the precursor of what's happening today in the sense that we took all those profits which were being distributed uh, in an egalitarian fashion or certainly uh, some kind of distributed fashion and then we compressed them and I would say there's probably three or four firms, uh, two or three, you know, Renaissance would have been one of them and D.E. Shaw. Those companies really took that entire profit structure or that, that, that Property ecosystem, and then well, the inefficiency that they they were getting paid for, which was just a kind of an inefficiency and a burden on the market, just went into to, to a different place. It only shifted. Shifted. I wouldn't call it inefficient. It's just the transactional nature of being a liquidity provider. It went from being distributed among a hundred thousand people to being distributed, say, among a thousand people, uh, and it was, and that was the power uh, of that was the power of the computer, right? And so. We're obviously facing that daily as the uh, today as uh, the economy changes and morphs, and you're seeing that right now with this massive income stratification too, right? As the people who have the quant skills are able to do at scale what it used to took, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of humans to do. Well, you could see that, you know, now you have. Uber has displaced how many taxi drivers? Right. So the valuation of Uber, which you know, 50, 60, whatever you think it's worth, um, is valuation that attaches to how many venture capitalists versus how many hundreds of thousands of taxi drivers that don't have an income. Right. And so that's another form. You know, that's just an example that repeats over and over. On the other hand, that ecosystem that used to be on Wall Street, and you might as well you know, put in the specialist system as well, they all found Same jobs. Thing. But they, they did. They all found jobs. So anyway, just to go, so you start your hedge fund, and let me just take you to 1987. That was mm -hmm. a big moment for mm -hmm. you, the year of the great crash. Well, the crash of 87 was really interesting um, just because the crash of 87 probably never would have happened except for, again, uh, the market infrastructure at that point in time. Um, I remember, because I started out, in 76 trading commodities. And so for 120 years, uh, all commodity futures had limits. And I remember so many times uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, where the cotton market would be limit up or the soybean market would be limit up because that was the allowable amount that prices could move. And they would not let them go anymore because they knew the irrationality of, of human nature and the, and the possibility of what a mob can do to yeah. anything. Um, so they had limits. Now, financial futures come along. Here's a funny story. Do you know I tried to work for Goldman in 1984 uh, when y'all were first starting, the, when y'all were first thinking about futures and they went, ah, oh, that's not futures. No, 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 we're not. Listen, I couldn't we're, get we're a job. Not, we're I, not going to do that because we're Goldman. We're, <laughs> I'm not going to be in that. I, I didn't get a job at Goldman. I only got a job at Jay Aaron. Okay. And Jay Aaron was bought by Goldman. That's right. Yeah. Right. That's right. What so anyway, what is it with these Goldman guys? Oh God, I don't know. <laughs> just, Stuck up, incredibly inflated. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so '87, there were no limits. There were no limits on any financial futures. It was yeah. just a. It was a, an absolute accident waiting to happen. And then they started portfolio insurance. Uh, and in 87, you could just look on any kind of historic, historical metric and see the stock market was stupidly overvalued. Ten-year rates were 10.5%, and I think the dividend yield on the stock market was about 45 or 5 So just think about that compared to today, right? 500 
basis point, we'd have, we'd have 10 year rates right now at something like uh, seven and a quarter, seven and a half. Well, the forward price of the stock would have been a lot Yeah, exactly. Lot but they weren't then. And so when the market finally broke, I mean, the one thing that, that's, that I would say I've learned the past 40 years is these, you know, price patterns and, and price stories, this, this, it's the same old story so often. Just, just with different characters, different times, different plots. And so that looked a lot like 1929 to me. And I knew for a fact that if and when it broke because uh, of the derivative structure, that the downside was going to be unlimited, literally unlimited, because uh, there were no limits on futures. And I would kind of liken it to this past February's market break. We had that kind of, what was that? Was it a 7 or 8% in one week? And you had all the VIX ETNs, you had all the short VIX structures. Those were just, an, that was just a bomb ready to explode. That was just a matter of time. And that entire break in the first week of February was all derivative inspired. Uh, and if I think of some of the greatest financial crises of the last 30 years, they, generally speaking, uh, are derivative inspired because that's where all the leverage is. Leverage, right. Yeah. And so, um, well, I can't help but ask, you see, and now, well, you've made some, uh, some aspects analogous to the current position. Now, it's obviously not that bad. The, the interest, the, the, le the return, the dividend versus interest rate isn't, isn't where it was. You see a lot of excesses in the current market? I would say that we have, uh, well, I think right now, when you look at kind of any asset price, you, you have to be thinking that this is uh, a highly dubious, sustainable price. And I say that for a couple of reasons. Um, one, first and foremost, I don't think monetary policy, the way it's currently conducted, is sustainable over time. We have, if you think about just history, history is the normal real 10-year rates, 200 basis points, and right now we're probably minus 30 or 40. The normal real short-term rates 100 to 120 basis points, and we're probably negative 40 right now. So, uh, so clearly, interest rate policy is crazy. Like, if you had just parachuted in and said we have a 3.8% unemployment, 2.8% CPI, water rates, you'd just four and a half, five. five or something like that. So you know rates ultimately are not sustainable because ultimately, much like the late 60s, we had Operation Twist in the 50s and 60s where we manipulated interest rates and had low real rates. And then everyone kind of the 60s got used to zero rates, zero real rates, and that set us up for the 70s. And so I think we're doing the same thing again. So I don't think monetary policy is sustainable. And clearly, fiscal policy, are you kidding me? We're, we're going to be... Right. We're going to be four this year, add a half a percent every year for the next five or six years. We'll be at seven in three years. Uh, that's not sustainable. So you look at prices of stocks, real estate, anything, you know in the long run that we have to get back to some type. We're going to have to mean revert back to a normal real rate of interest with a normal term premium that's existed for 250 years. Uh, we're going to have to get back to that. We're going to have to get back to a sustainable fiscal policy. And that probably means uh, price of assets go down in the very long run. Now, the short run, uh, you know, it's just... Lighter fluid on a fire. I was going to say jacked up, ready yes. to go. Flare, flare, That's flare. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it, you know, it, it, it's kind of amazing, but it's, uh, you know pouring lighter fluid on, a, on an already lit fire. Two, two problems with that. One is it flares, and the other problem is you don't have the lighter fluid left for when you need it. So it'll be. So if ju just imagine uh, the next recession comes. What do you do? Oh, my God. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be interesting. They're going to, this will be. Where are you going to be when that happens? <laughs> uh, well, hopefully I'll have been really short. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's a very good question. Uh, the next recession's really frightening because we don't have any stabilizers. Uh, we'll have monetary policy, which will exhaust very quickly, but we don't have any fiscal st stabilizers. In 2000, the last time we were at 3.8% unemployment, we had a 2.5% budget surplus. Yeah. I guess the hope is uh, from, the, uh, from the guys who are putting out the policy is that the, uh, 
that the rate of growth grows to a point where it just solves the problem. It doesn't it seems like a stretch, but that's the uh, that's the claim. <laughs> you laugh. I just have I have to You're say it. I have to I have to say it for equal. Uh, <laughs> you could have said that to me when Reagan was president. Yeah, 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 yeah. But okay, so listen. So we go th your your career as a trader, but you have another career simultaneous, for which I'd have to say you are very, very famous in a narrow place, but you've had a much bigger effect on people, I would say, in your other career, which is that of a philanthropist. And I'd say that that's a highfalutin expression, except you started being a philanthropist probably around the same start time you started your firm, maybe even earlier. Could you take us through that stage? And I, remind, I, I brought up to you that I remember at the time there was this um, novel idea that, um, who's the person who originated the I Have a Dream? The, Gene Lang. Gene La right, Gene Lang came up where he adopted a kindergarten class and he pledged to support those kids through college if they stuck to it. And then right after it, I heard about it, there's this young guy my age, where the heck was I, who also did it, and that was uh, Paul Jones. So I, I was, I remember I was at uh, home on my, I'm in my apartment in my couch, uh, and I think I was 32 or 33, and I saw the 60 Minutes piece on I Have a Dream, and uh, again, that was a, that was that was a calling. I saw that and I went, I can do that. I can do that to my. And I called Gene Lang the next day, because uh, I I felt uh, at that point in time that there was something really missing in my life. I grew up, probably like your family. I, I think acts of uh, kindness were, uh, it's like brushing your teeth with my mother and father. So they were always that way. When I saw that 60 Minutes piece, it was very resonant with me. I called Gene Lang, I adopted this class, and uh, I remember they had this meeting uh, where everyone was gonna get a, was gonna get a borough. There was, I think there were five of us, and I got late, and so they gave me Bed-Stuy, bed, -Stuy, bed -Stuy, do or die. I'm uh, from East New York, so I grew up there. It was all, anyway, so that became a long-term love affair between me and Bed-Stuy, and I adopted this class, and Wow, that was such an eye-opening experience because I had no uh, skill, no social, no sociological skills, no insights, no idea, no anything. All I had was you're from this. Memphis, so crying out loud. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna let that. What do that you know go. about uh, <laughs> Bedford Stuyvesant? I, I, it's true, uh, actually, particularly in Bed Stuy. So anyway, I went there and. Uh, Boy, three years in, it was wild because all of a sudden we lost some kids to violence. Uh, we had a significant proportion of our... How many kids you start with? We had 86. And, um, and so I had no idea what I was doing. I say three years in, it was really evident that I was way over my head. And our scores were not improving at school. We'd have report card night every quarter and our scores never uh, uh, got any better. And one of the reasons, we had, a, we, we had an after-school program, but our after-school program was more around kind of touchy-feely, we'd play sports and stuff like that. I mean, literally had no idea whatsoever. Uh, and then we started, we started having, um, I would say about four years in, uh, we started having some young mothers in the program, and it was just, it was just really overwhelming. How many kids and, made it to college? I think we ended up getting, uh, I think we ended up getting 31 into college, and I think we ended up, which would be about four times the neighborhood rate, and then I think we ended up graduating about half of that class, and that was actually the crucible that was so important for me okay. on my journey because I learned there's a there was a huge difference between effort and outcome because I'd put between so it. much. Gosh, I think we were probably spending four or five thousand dollars per kid per year with nothing. To, when I say nothing to show for it, the, the the metrics that you'd look for, right? The academic scores, uh, uh, grade matriculation, attendance, dropouts. We weren't improving on any of that because there was no focus and there was no delineation of what the mission was, and there was no uh, understanding between us and the kids, we weren't providing them the support that they needed, and their environment, their, the, the background noise was so great that just being their friend and just 
giving them promises wasn't enough to overcome uh, a really challenging environment they grew up in. So that was, I think the I Have a Dream experience was really informative for what we ended up doing uh, in Robin Hood. Because it taught you to focus on outcomes and not outcomes. just to appreciate the effort, but not to reward, uh, efforts, reward the outcomes. It, effort all, it's not that it's irrelevant, but you really have to be so goal-oriented and you have to have milestones along the way and you have to hold yourself accountable. Uh, and all those things I learned uh, really early on. But I loved, I loved the idea and I loved the class uh, and I kept adopting classes all the way through until I'd say the, uh, the mid-90s. And then the mid-90s were disappointing because uh, all the classes in the after-school program that stayed with us were literally 90% girls. Uh, and so it was disappointing that uh, the young boys could not keep up with the girls. Now, I've got a boy and three girls, and we all know so, the yeah, girls it's, are... Yeah, you're just finding out the <laughs> eternal truth. That, that boys may be a little developmentally challenged, but... Uh, <laughs> It was, it, was, uh, it was still eye-opening, and that was when I, uh, I actually shifted focus and said, okay, uh, I'm spending all this money. Forget trying to be an after-school program and putting a Band-Aid on the problem. Why not instead attack it uh, from the beginning? And, and, I, and uh, that's when I started a charter school which was uh, Bed-Stuy Excellence for Boys. We started one, I wanted to start one specifically for boys because they were so developmentally challenged and we ended up starting one for girls also, but we started with boys. Uh, and that actually ended up being one of the happiest uh, endeavors of my life because really early on, I'd say, uh, and I was working with Norman Atkins, who you remember was, uh, I think well, my wife is on the board. Yes. Yes, she she's works very phenomenal. hard. phenomenal. Well, you're nice uh, to say that. No, she is phenomenal. She's incredible. Uh, and it was just wonderful because it was really evident from the very beginning that with the right uh, inspiration, uh, direction, focus, educational infrastructure, that you could, you could just blow the whole myth of the achievement gap away. And I would say within five years, I think we were, maybe it was four years, we were number one out of uh, 543 elementary schools in That's Manhattan. Amazing. With 98% uh, African American inner city kids. You know, I could, I could talk for too long just about what I know you've done. And every time I talk to you, I just discover something else. Um, but in the interest of time, take us through Robin Hood and what you tried to accomplish, in fact, pretty lavishly have accomplished in Robin Hood? Well, I'd say Robin Hood in the early years was uh, like Three Stooges without the pie fight. So it's thirty, um, a little over 30 years yeah, ago. I would say in the beginning, it was just a couple of us making it up as we went. But again, we were being, the good thing is we were being informed by our failings along the way. And very quickly, we realized we're going to become outcome focused. Uh, and you know, the best part of Robin Hood is, I think, um, in fact, the best part of, and I hate to, I, the word philanthropy for whatever reason. I know, it just, it, it, it sounds does, a little, you know. The best part of my professional career. Investing, really. Has been, has been uh, being involved in, on the charitable side. If I think of all my best friends, of all the people who I hang around with, enjoy the most, uh, spend the most time with has generally been people that I've met through some of those endeavors. You find the greatest people and you find this communal bond and there's so much joy that comes from that and so much happiness. So I'd say that's on a selfish basis has been uh, the best part of it. And Robin Hood really, if I think about a collection of thousands if not tens of thousands of noble hearts minds uh, that is what that has been. It's been uh, we call it Robin Hood Nation. It truly is. You know you were on the board. Uh, and it's funny because I've seen so many people, people come in, they stay with us forever, they come in for a period of time, they leave us, but I think they always leave 
no matter what level of engagement, they leave larger and bigger and happier and more purpose. I just remember, I, I just have to say this because you won't say it about yourself, it's not just what you give or the effectiveness, but I tell you, I learned a lot. I, I learned a lot that I've applied. As something came up the other day, I remembered during, right after 9-11, when, every, when this whole community downtown was running around the small business and couldn't get anything, and everybody's looking, how do you get them money? And everybody had to apply, you know, into the government forms, who needs the money and verification. You and Robin Hood just went out and made the statement. I wasn't at that meeting. I heard it. I came to Robin Hood after that, but made the declaration, why don't we just give $5,000 to everybody who says he or she needs it? No questions asked. How many people who don't deserve it will ask relative to how many people won't get it if we require some kind of bureaucracy or verification? Where do we want to be on this? To accidentally give it to a few too many people or to give it to no one at a, at a, at a, at a timely time in their need? That was, an, you know, that was an unbelievable concept at that time. Yeah, so we had the concert for 9-11 uh, and we raised about $60 million and the question is how do we help out on behalf of the victims uh, of the towers and, uh, and the firefighters and the policemen and what was so interesting is there was so much bureaucracy and red tape that those families were receiving nothing and so here all of a sudden it comes the holidays, comes the end of the year, they're getting nothing. We said look let's just go and give $5,000 to every family, and we couldn't even find the list of people that had passed away. So Robin Hood literally uh, ended up getting the list that became the list, uh, and then we just sent everybody a FedEx check for $5,000. It's amazing the impact that that had because there's all this talk about all this help, and yet none of it was hitting the ground. So you know, that, was, that was one of our better moments. We, you know, the, the, the other thing is it's so funny uh, going back to the calling, so many of the initiatives that we've had at Robin Hood have been in response. It's almost like we were called to it. Back in the uh, early 90s when AIDS was such a huge problem, um, and the real problem with AIDS was that it was being spread by needles. And so well, I, I remember we had on our board, we had uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. and Jan Winter, who was the editor of Rolling Stone, and we had... Uh, Langone, Ken Langone and yeah. Druckenmiller, and we had this big argument over whether we should be funding the needle exchange in, uh, I guess it was Williamsburg Park, because that's where all the addicts were. And so the, 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 the left was going, we can't do this, we'll be attacked. And then, the, and then Langone and Druckenmiller are going, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it, it works, this is how we're going to stop. Right, so the right, the right wingers wanted to support the, you know, wanted to support the drug, you know, the, yeah, uh, so was, the, the was, instruments, the enablers. Uh, right. But we've been involved in a bunch of those, teenage pregnancy, that, 9-11, Sandy Relief. Uh, we, but that's uh, the that, point, it, was, it wasn't just conventional, it wasn't just, I always thought it was like really, you know, people use the term venture philanthropy or invest, yeah. social investing, but you really brought a lot of novelty and insight that in the first instance I found jarring, and afterwards I said, thought this is the most sensible way to spend philanthropic dollars. Yeah, I, and I would say we're, we're still doing that. In fact, I'd say that's the most important focus. We have a new executive director, Wes Moore. He's phenomenal. His, 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 that he's bringing all of us on board to is we've got to focus on social mobility because right now your future level of income is pretty much determined more so than it's ever been in the history of this country by your parents' income. So social mobility probably is going to be our number one focus going forward. How do you break that, that uh, how do you break those chains that hold you back? You know, it's amazing. Here we are, the land of the free, of equal opportunity, and yet we right now have uh, literally the most rigid uh, social constrictions and restrictions on our young people than they've ever faced in, in the history of this country. And it's, it's embarrassing, frankly. Well, I could keep, I, I, by the way, just as a number, how much money has Robin Hood distributed? For the, we're, we're, right, we're right at $3 billion. Nice round number. It's, it's, it's a good start. Yeah, See, we started out with $10,000 trading and now we're up to $3 billion of uh, philanthropic giving. Um, I, I, I love this topic, but I, I, I want to mm -hmm. talk about uh, just capital which is what I, what I refer to as your you know, wholesale mm -hmm. kind of institutional approach to this, which I think is very important to give you a chance before we lose our Yahoo audience. Okay, so uh, just 
that was, again, that was another calling. The last thing I wanted to do was get involved in, a, in another not-for-profit. Deepak Chopra calls me up and said, Paul, I have this student, and he has this idea, and the idea is why can't corporations be a force for goodness? Why can't they use their capital, human and financial, for just causes, just capital, if you will? Uh, and I thought, oh, God, Deepak, please. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, all right, well, you know, let me think about it. I'll call you back. And then I went home, and I remember at Robin Hood, we were trying so desperately to get a matching grant from New York City. Because that was always in, in philanthropy where you're fighting neighborhood by neighborhood. If you can get the government to come in and match the private. My funding. stuff works. Why don't they fund it? Yes, yes. Uh, and then I started thinking, hmm, okay, so private philanthropy in the U.S. is $360 billion, and the federal government's $4 trillion, so that's 10 times the size. And then the private sector is $15 trillion, so that's four times the size of the, the, the government sector. Really, if, if we're going to have societal change, it's going to happen. It has to happen uh, through the way we do business. And... Then I called him back, and, uh, uh, and I said, you know what, let me call my good friends at Goldman. Well, no, let's story. talk about the index, though, how it's okay. organized, because I don't think they appreciate what it is. Okay, so anyway, uh, basically we ended up... We'll get up, back to your good friends at Goldman. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so long story short, we came to the idea where we would create uh, an index of... Uh, we'd take the Russell 1000, which is the 1,000 largest U.S. companies, and we would create an index with a whole variety of metrics on it. And the index, we kept thinking, oh, Lord, if we create it, we're going to be accused of some type of bias. And so the secret sauce of just is that we go to the American people and we poll them every year. What's important to you? And we ask them, blank sheet of paper, tell us what you think is important for corporate justice. Uh, and the amazing thing is the American people have an incredible story to tell, and it's totally different than the way Wall Street uh, operates. And no better example of that was that when I talked to you last week, I said, how are you doing? And going, well, I said, when are you going to retire? And you said, oh, God, 43 quarters of earnings reports. I just don't know. I, I, I love it so 48. much. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> 43, 43 quarters. And that's exactly what just gets to, which is um, what this does is it, it goes through and asks the American public what's important. You're thinking about how am I going to get my ass kicked right. because I might miss no, this no, quarter's Yeah, in which way this quarter was. Yeah, gonna how, am I, how am I going to go up, take him to the shed? And the American public says, no, 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 no. Most important thing that, that requires, that determines justice is. How do you pay and treat your people? That's 23%. And the second thing they say is, um, how do you treat your customers? Uh, the third thing is, are your products, do you, make, uh, do you make quality products at a good cost and are they socially beneficial? Fourth is, are your operations environmentally sustainable? Fifth is, uh, are you helping out uh, with local communities? Sixth is, domestic job creation. Are you creating jobs that give people uh, a financial uh, a financial sense of well-being. And finally, seventh, and it's in single digits, is how are you serving the interest of your shareholders and management? And that's wild when you think about it, because here's the American public that thinks shareholders getting profits clocks in at 7% when we know the way Wall Street's managed is 85% of what we do. And is you found dealing a correlation with between the, the best-ranked companies and financial success, and which the is kind amazing of, thing kind is, of convenient. So, so, so there's there's a, there's actually a, a, a fantastic story here in that the top 50 percent of that Russell 1000 that uh, is in this new ETF that we've created called the uh, called the Just 500, uh, and the symbol's JUST. They, on average, they pay better than the bottom uh, the bottom 50 percent. They create 20% more jobs on average. They get fined anywhere from 70 90% less. Uh, they give 2.3 times more to charity. And the 
real kicker is they earn 7% more ROE on average. So uh, if, you, uh, if you follow what the American public says are the most important things, then you end up not only being just, but you also end up being more profitable. Now we can discuss why that is, and of course, one of the reasons why that is is because if the biggest metric is employee pay and treatment, obviously those companies that are at the forefront sure. of whatever the evolving economy are probably have the highest skilled, most motivated uh, workforce that's making great products and treating customers well. So it's a really simple business model that actually has a, a ton of alpha in it. So I do think it's important that we as a society rethink uh, the old definition of capitalism which Milton Friedman famously espoused and he said the social responsibility of a company is to improve its profits. Now he said that in 1970 when tax rates were 91 percent had just come to 70 and wealth inequality was one-fifth of what it is today but actually what he said and it's so funny, the last movie I saw was, I went back and saw, watched Wall Street, where Gordon Gecko famously said, greed is good, greed is what makes the country great, blah, blah, blah. And I think that was the rallying cry for years in my generation, right? That was probably the high watermark of greed that, yeah. when that movie came uh, out. Well, you know, or just... Not, or you know, the success of greed. So, so, so the interesting thing about 1985 is, is that since then, since... Uh, since that time, the bottom 90% of Americans owned 35% of the wealth then. Today, that bottom 90% owns 23% of the wealth, and that 12 has gone to the top one-tenth of 1%. Sure. So, um, something... Who might that be? <laughs> so, but I'm just saying, do we think this is a sustainable... No. Is this definition of capitalism sustainable and um, it will be it will be reversed by hook or by crook yeah one way or the other I think Marie Antoinette would yes, be a great exactly. example of no it's probably not and so and it's funny because the father of capitalism was Adam Smith and Adam Smith said if justice is removed the great immense fabric of society will in a moment dissipate into atoms and I think if we just think about what's happened over the past 30 years that's not just. And uh, hopefully what this little idea here is through social norming, through changing people's perceptions, every, every culture is based on what our peers think is right. So it's more than just, just an end. You can get back to your good friends at Goldman now if you like. <laughs> so, so anyway, that, anyway, so it was with Goldman's help that uh, we started doing a lot of this research. And, and along the way, we realized this index, not only will we drive investor behavior, but will also drive consumer behavior because we're going to have the just 100, the top 100 companies. And they have a seal which they can affix their products for the year that they're in the top 10%. And so hopefully five years from now, just will be ubiquitous. And when you go to buy a box of cornflakes, maybe there'll be one with the just seal and maybe there'll be one that won't. And hopefully you'll, you'll sure. pick up this one and it'll make management think about how, what is the sharing arrangement? And, um, and the between point is, it can also be investable, so the people can also reward the company by giving more capital. More capital. And employees, I've got four kids in my 20s. They're, anybody can go to our website right now and look at the top thousand companies in America and see how they rank on metrics. Goldman, you'll be happy to know, is, uh, I think, 65 out of 1,000. Uh, oh, my and, God, we're such strivers. That's terrible. <laughs> so... so, so you'll be able to look and you'll be able to see how that company scores on a variety of metrics and you can vote with, with your feet where you want to work. I want to work at a good place. Not only that, it's a reward because again, it becomes, then becomes easier for companies to raise capital and because, and people aren't, it's not an act of charity. These are actually better companies you're, in your Correct. point of view. That's terrific. Um, I think we're going to turn it over. Oh, let, me, let me ask you, it's th at 3.45, do we uh, lose our audience? For our streaming audience? What does that mean? Yes. Okay, I want to thank the people at Yahoo for streaming the, uh, the conversation so far. Uh, so thank you very much, and thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Lord.